So radical orthodoxy is, has been linked to a very similar movement in 20th century Catholic thought um, that was really concerned with a group of French theologians, both Jesuits and Dominicans. And it became known as Ressourcement Theology or La Nouvelle Theologie, the New Theology. And this was really concerned with, uh, again, returning Christian theology to its sources and to understand what was going on with Ressourcement Theology, the resourcing of the church. We need to go back to the late 19th century and look at um, what became known as neo-scholasticism and the way that theology was taught and understood at that time. And uh, in the late 19th century, Catholic theological education was often uh, known as manualist. And what this means is that theology was taught not by reading primary texts or the Bible. So you wouldn't actually read Thomas Aquinas himself. You wouldn't often study the Bible in any great depth. What you would read is manuals of theology. They were kind of textbooks that gave you a very abstract but pristine Catholic Christian doctrine. These are the principles you need to learn. And the idea is that this doctrine is just passed on pristine and unchanged to each new generation. You just need to learn these principles. Uh, and that really is the, the essence of Christianity. And uh, this is particularly associated with figures like the Dominican Reginald Gary Goulagrange. And, and Gary Goulagrange um, taught a, a, a host of young Catholic theologians around the turn of the 20th century that included Marie Dominique Chenu, Included on Henri de Lubac. And these thinkers were very, very, very uncertain about this manualist tradition. And what they wanted to do was go back and read the texts themselves and look at what Aquinas had actually said, look at what Augustine had actually said, look at what the Bible actually said. And what they found was a very different vision. And uh, so they tried to unthink everything they'd been taught. In that sense, it was a remarkable achievement, Resourcement, all in the context of the turmoils of 20th century Europe, the First World War and the Second World War, where they were constantly being moved around, the, the resources they had in terms of libraries and so on were extremely limited, yet they produced these great, very erudite works that had a massive impact on, on 20th century Catholic theology. And what they arrived at was a particular theological vision that was really contrary to, to what prevailed in the late 19th century with neo-scholasticism. So neo-scholasticism thought that there was a fundamental distinction to be made between the order of nature and the order of grace. So what they thought was that essentially the order of nature as created um, is, is its own order and this is the order of human reason of what we can achieve by our own natural powers and this is insufficient for salvation it's insufficient for the knowledge of God himself uh, we can know that God exists by our own natural powers we can achieve certain goods despite original sin and yet to this natural order needs to be added, put on top as it were, a separate order of grace that comes as it were from the outside, super added that orientates human beings up to their supernatural end, their supernatural end in God, the vision of God, and therefore brings about salvation and brings revelation of, for example, the truths about God that cannot be arrived at through reason alone, for example, the doctrine of the Trinity. But what we have here is two quite distinct orders of nature and grace, and the notion of grace as superadded to nature, and therefore of revelation superadded to reason, and of faith then superadded to reason. So we've still got this modern dualism between grace, nature, faith, reason, revelation, natural theology. And what the resourcement theologians, particularly de Lubac, wanted to do was go back and say, is that really the way that things were understood in Aquinas? Is it the way that uh, 
the relationship between grace and nature was articulated in patristic theology. And Marie Dominique Chenu as well, uh, the great scholar of Aquinas, wanted to go back to the sources, to go back to the primary texts and try to understand what really was going on. And what they came up with was the idea that, was the realisation that far from being super added to nature as something in a sense different from or even alien to nature, that nature is always already graced, that grace as it were encompasses creation, that humanity is always in some sense um, always already orientated to its supernatural end. So grace as it were works in and through nature and the, the mantra that was, was often uh, used is that grace does not destroy nature but perfects it. So the idea is that grace makes nature more natural. It fulfills it, it completes it. And this was seen in the texts of Aquinas, uh, although the debate about the interpretation of Aquinas of course still goes on. And they rejected the idea that there is anything like a natura pura, a pure nature, separate from the arena of grace. And having seen that nature is always already orientated to the order of grace, that grace is not, doesn't arrive as something in extrinsic, but works in and through nature, to perfect nature towards its supernatural end. They also saw that faith is not alien to reason. So reason doesn't simply belong to a separate natural realm, that faith doesn't belong to a separate realm of grace, that faith isn't somehow extrinsic to reason, but just as grace is the perfection of nature, so faith is the perfection of reason, so theology is the perfection of philosophy. So all of a sudden they wanted to, although maintain a distinction between grace and nature, faith and reason, theology and philosophy. They didn't want any separation of grace and nature, theology and philosophy, faith and reason. So they were seen as different intensities, if you like, of a, of a single spectrum, a single sphere, a single order of knowledge, a single order of existence. And so all of a sudden you're faced with uh, again, a vision of uh, the grace of God not arriving, the salvific grace of God not arriving as something extrinsic or unexpected or unanticipated within the created order, but arriving as the very fulfilment, the consummation of that created order. And so theology not arriving as something alien to philosophy, but theology is arriving as the consummation of philosophy. And so radical orthodoxy sees theology and philosophy as intimately linked, always interlinked, never collapsed into each other, just as grace isn't collapsed into the order of nature. But the distinction does not betoken a division between them. They're not separate realms. This isn't a dualism. So. Radical orthodoxy sees the demise of what's known as the metaphysics of participation, this, this idea that creation is always participating in God and owes its being at every moment to God's gift of, of existence, of created existence. This metaphysics of participation goes right the way back to Plato's thought and the way that he understands the relationship between the visible realm that we inhabit, what he calls the realm of becoming, the realm of change, because everything is always becoming something else, it makes things ungraspable, and the realm of being, the forms, and particularly the form of the good, which is eternal and unchanging and therefore supremely knowable in itself. And he says that becoming participates in being, that the visible realm participates in the transcendent realm of, of the forms. But Plato never really makes crystal clear what he means by participation. He uses lots of different words to uh, 
describe this relationship between the finite and the infinite, between the transcendent and the visible. He uses words like uh, methexis, which we often straightforwardly translate as participation, but also words like simploke, which means interweaving, or even koinonia, a word we know well from the New Testament, communion. But what all these words really hint at, what they betoken, is intimacy, proximity, closeness, the idea that the finite is interwoven with the infinite, that creation is interwoven with God. So really it's not this notion that God is a, is a distant creator designer, as 18th century deism would have it, but that everything simply by virtue of being created immediately points beyond itself to its creator, that it shimmers with transcendence. And so one even finds this idea in the Neoplatonic tradition, right the way up to Nicholas of Cusa, the German cardinal writing in the 15th century, that to look at creation in the right way, to look at finite visible things with the right eyes, is in a sense to, to see God, to see the divine, which is a remarkable idea, really. Um, and really reminds us that before the modern world, the whole of the created order is understood as sacramental in the proper sense of being symbolic. A sacrament is a visible sign of an inward and spiritual reality, as we know from Peter Lombard, the medieval theologian. Um, but the, the, the created order is a sacramental order. It's a symbolic order, which can be read like any other s system of symbols. It can be read as indicative of the creator, as pointing beyond itself compared to the modern understanding of creation as a series of objects which have functional value. So, you know, creation is a series of things that are natural resources, things that we might just use, uh, that don't have any intrinsic worth, but are simply for, uh, for human convenience or human use. Uh, and this will be a, a very characteristically modern way of understanding that the nature of the created order that is really very different from this notion that creation is a sacramental order, a symbolic order that is to be read, that participates continually in the divine and therefore is luminous with the light of its creator.